Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Small Business Briefing. It's Monday, July 26th. Uh, and this briefing is brought to you by Marana Group. Marana Group is a data document and distribution solutions company. Marana Group offers a full line of solutions designed to get your company's message into the right hands in a timely and cost-effective manner. You can find out more at maranagroup.com. Uh, Brian, uh, earlier today, the Veterans Administration, the VA, announced that uh, it would uh, require its employees to be vaccinated. And um, uh, we'll come back around to this, but it just seems a, a, a little um, interesting, if not ominous, that um, you know a federal agency now has joined what some other healthcare systems have done in requiring their employees to be vaccinated. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about this as we go through the um, the briefing today. But um, it it does, especially those entities that are connected to healthcare, appear to be moving toward um, vaccine mandates for employees. So we've seen some health systems around the country, which have um, which have already um, done so, and others that are waiting for. Um, the FDA to do the final approval um, on the vaccines. Uh, and right now they have emergency use authorization. Um, they've already decided to give it regular approval. Um, they're gonna do that in um, August or September. It's just a bureaucratic process. They're not waiting on any more information or data. They just have, a, they just have to wait a certain number of days and then they'll be doing it. You'll see probably a pretty big push at that point where, um, where many healthcare institutions, especially for those um, employees that have direct customer facing or patient facing uh, relationships will, will move pretty quickly at that point. I think especially with hospitals, it'll be the exception to the rule that don't require, but, um, but we, have seen it, uh, we have seen some that have moved forward even, even ahead of that. So seeing a federal agency though do it um, with, the, with the VA, of course, you know the VA is a healthcare um, organization, but the um, but seeing the Fed's move, I think, is is another little clue in some things that I'm picking up on that uh, that the Feds um, might be actively considering additional um, national rules and standards. That as we kind of get into the numbers and, and the rest of this briefing, um, can maybe guess a little bit and what that um, and and what might come of that. In, uh, in the months ahead. So we see a pretty dynamic time period right now in, uh, in the US where in, in other uh, countries around the world, things are, um, are uh, in, in some places in pretty bad shape with the pandemic. Um, in the US, um, moderately good shape uh, still, but rising in many areas in other countries, especially in the South, just like we saw last summer. And, uh, and so the question is, you know, are we facing a tough fall uh, here in the Midwest, much like we did last fall, um, time will tell on that. Um, the the models what, that the CDC does, um, they try to model out these things. They're not a lot of help. There's so much variety uh, in in there in in the ups and downs. What they think is the best and worst case scenario. That frankly, they don't help at all. <laughs> I think these models are are so wide ranging in their expected outcomes that um, I get the impression that they have no idea what to expect because we have different variants in play. We have different um, uh, vaccination um, percentages. We have different um, natural immunities all across the, the country. And I just get the feeling that I really don't know what uh, the future is gonna hold. For my part, part though, I look at places like Great Britain as is a pretty good indication, a precursor of what could happen here. And, um, and so uh, as we've seen in, infections rise in Great Britain uh, to a pretty high level, surprisingly high given their uh, success in um, their early success in vaccination, but much like us, they kind of hit a plateau where they couldn't quite get past it. Uh, but the good news is that after um, many weeks, actually a couple months of rising uh, cases where they got pretty high, all of a sudden, last week, they peaked and started coming down. And the good news is they uh, did so without additional restrictions. They delayed removing some restrictions in Great Britain, but they didn't put any additional restrictions in place. And, um, and the numbers peaked and then uh, knock on wood, uh, they started to come, come down. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that that means that 
Um, if, if we are to face a challenge here that it'll be relatively short lived and will not require any, um, any additional uh, restriction and uh, regulatory um, actions that you know, frankly, many, many, many small businesses are in no shape to be able to withstand after the, the 16 or 17 months we just went through. Yeah. Well, that is why we continue to sort of obsess about the data uh, because of the, the implications. It's why we'll continue to watch. Um, uh, this just incidentally is uh, our 186th briefing. And you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, I, uh, people are probably wondering where you are today, Brian. Uh, you're at Spring Arbor University and uh, uh, we are going to continue to do this this briefing uh, wherever we are. And so today we find you at Spring Arbor. I'm glad you're there working with the Student Statesmanship Institute uh, as a speaker. Hey, it's Data Monday. Let's um, let's dig in a little bit to to what's going on around Michigan. Let me let me ask you this: Is the is the Merck still meeting? The Michigan Economic Recovery Council is the source of a lot of the data that we looked at at, at the beginning. Yeah, the, the Michigan Economic Recovery Council is, I'll say, dormant um, right now. The uh, low and stayed low for an extended period of time. The um, they decided uh, to to not continue with the uh, with the with their meetings and putting together the graphs. So you'll see when we share data these days, we're we're taking it from different sources. There's a few that I. I like that stay up on um, on uh, on the information. If we're just looking at Michigan, like we're going to today, then I'll look at Michigan.gov, but also um, Bridge Magazine, which has a really nice comprehensive um, site. And then um, if we're looking around the world, uh, the New York Times has. Uh, there's a lot of organizations that have charts from around the world, but I like the way the charts um, are organized, and I can get to them easy, and they're really um, very up to date looking around the country and around the world. Uh, so I'll, I'll usually borrow from there. So right now we, um, we got, got in, the, in the habit of calling these Merck reports. Technically they're not anymore, but it's the same data that, uh, that we were looking at uh, before. And uh, we'll see, I mean, I, I guess I'll take that as a big hint if the governor calls for uh, the Merck to start meeting again, then um, probably not a good sign. So why don't we, let's go ahead and, uh, and, and share uh, the, the Michigan update here. So um, I want to start with uh, just the just the cases. So as you take a look at this, the um, you'll see it's it's quite low. It's as low as it was last June, but last June it didn't stay that low for very long. It stayed a, it stayed super low for a little bit longer this June than it did last July, and we'd hope that it would be relatively better because uh, because you know the a portion of our population is uh, is vaccinated now, and uh, and so the um, but we do see that the case is starting to rise here. This looks nothing like many other states, especially those in the south, where you see kind of a, a really sharp, abrupt upturn um, in the south, where they have lower vaccination rates. And in the summer, when it gets super hot and humid, is when they go indoors, so their cold and flu season. Um, it's not unusual for that to happen in the summertime, whereas ours happens in the fall. Uh, but if you look here, the cases um, on July 23rd uh, were, were 432 cases per million, and a week before that, it was 293. So you can see this on the rise, obviously much, much lower than, uh, than previous peaks and waves that we've faced. Um, but, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was you know, relatively low, higher, but uh, relatively low, um, through next month. I do think that we face some challenges um, at our, um, based on what we've seen happen in Great Britain and our similarity in vaccination rates, I think we face some challenges in the fall when uh, people start going, uh, going indoors. The other thing I wanna mention is that um, here you'll see July 23rd. Why, why is that so old? It's because the state of Michigan only updates the data two times per week. And uh, so that happens on Friday. This is the data from Friday. And then it happens on Tuesday. So we'll get an update uh, tomorrow. So just looking around the, um, around the state, the, uh, again, as of last Friday, these are reported cases last Friday, um, you'll see that there's nowhere in the state that 
um, that is beyond the 10 to 19 cases um, per million. So, uh, or I'm sorry, in this case, it's uh, per 100,000 is used on the chart. So um, relatively low um, numbers, or not relatively, just absolute low numbers across the, across the state. So again, still looking good. It's just that it's higher than it was before and definitely an upward trend that we see happening. In hospitalizations, we had continued to see those go down even after the case numbers had leveled out, not unusual, but it does look like they've flattened out now and, um, and if, not enough to call it a trend, but maybe just a touch, touch higher, but they had been coming down through last week pretty regularly um, across the board. So hospitalizations, certainly our hospitals look like they're in very good shape in terms of um, in terms of their census of COVID patients inside. Now it's not the case everywhere in the country. Um, in, uh, in some places in Florida, for example, they do have crowded hospitals uh, and so some of those hospitals are as full as they have ever been. The, um, and then uh, if, you, if you take a look at this slide, it's where you really see the, um, through the waves, you see the, the impact of the, of the vaccines. So um, you, you see it uh, continuing to get lower. That's great news. Of course, we've had a lot of good success with uh, with older Michiganders being uh, vaccinated. So, you know, overall, where our state stands today, it's pretty good. Uh, not pretty good. It's very good. It's it's just, you know, that the case numbers rising a little bit. If it weren't for the fact that there was a context of um, of the Delta variant being more contagious and, and numbers rising. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be very, very confident about um, where things stand today and where they might be in the immediate future. Uh, but given what we see happening in, in the South and given what we see happening um, across the pond in Europe um, and other, other places around the world too, and in, uh, in Southeast Asia and South America, there are definitely places where um, the pandemic is still um, raging out of control. And, uh, and so that creates and poses certain risks. Um, one other thing I was going to mention too, uh, so Great Britain is one place that we that we follow pretty closely. Just, you know, it's, it's um, climate and followed on the on the globe across. It's not that different from us. Um, but then uh, also the um, in Israel where they were kind of way out ahead and there was an initial study, this has not been peer reviewed yet, but um, an initial study that showed that those who had gotten the early, uh, gotten the vaccine earliest that, you know, that's been more than six months now and the effectiveness maybe, maybe trails off. So they say, if you've had uh, COVID-19 after about 90 days, it looks like your immunity, your natural immunity starts to wane. And, um, and it looks like with, uh, with um, vaccines after, or at least in, in an early look in Israel, that after six months, that uh, some of the protection might start to wane. Now, that's not a that's not a big surprise. The idea of boosters for vaccines is a very common thing. The idea that your immune system needs a reminder every once in a while uh, for uh, is 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 also um, very common. Not at all unusual. So, what should we expect? Well, probably should expect uh, in the future. That, um, that there'll be booster recommendations uh, that would do a, a couple of things. First, to kind of additional protection heading into more higher risk uh, time periods, but also maybe modified in order to, um, uh, to or tailored uh, to address more concerning variants that have come about since the original vaccines were produced. So all of that work is happening. We know the pharmaceutical companies have been working on uh, updates to the uh, to the vaccines in the future, but um, but uh, ultimately, I, 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 as much as I'd like to think this is mostly behind us, um, I think that we 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 still have some uh, some issues to work through in the in the future. Risks from around the the uh, the country and around the world um, that will have some impact on us here in uh, in Michigan. Our goal, of course, will be that uh, that our government at all levels, local, state, and federal, trust small business owners to run their businesses. You know, there's not a lot of surprises left 
in this, what, what you need to do to be safe and effective in, your, um, in, uh, in running your business is something that, um, that you know, our, our members have become very accustomed. They know what they need to do. And, um, and so if we're gonna continue this economic recovery that has slowly started, then uh, for small businesses, then um, job number one is to make sure that they're still allowed to operate. <laughs> so uh, that'll be uh, top of mind as we head into what could be a higher risk period here. And it's the, the reason that we continue to look at uh, vaccination rates um, uh, and, and sort of, uh, you know, continue to suggest that people, if they don't have a, have a, you know, a real objection to it personally, should go ahead and get their vaccination because it's, uh, it's really is what's going to make it possible or uh, less likely that we're going to see some more government intervention in this space. It's still true that less than 1% of those who are vaccinated um, uh, contract the, the disease and that 85% or so of those who are in the hospital are unvaccinated. Uh, it, it is, you know, the data is really clear that vaccinations really make a difference. They do, so and, and if I'm good too, yeah, what, what you know, is, is we've been advocating for um, that, you know, for, first of all, they're safe and they, and they work, but um, the one thing that's really important to us is that, uh, is that you never hear anything that sounds like a condescending message from the Small Business Association of Michigan. I mean, our interest is making sure our members are allowed to operate their businesses without um, interruption and you know lockdowns and restrictions, capacities and and onerous rules that make it um, expensive for them to operate. But also the type of rules that push their customers to the giant, uh, the corporate giants and international conglomerates that are that are well suited for when the government claps down on, act, on activities. And um, so so we have an interest for that reason but it's your choice, right? And, and every individual needs to make their own choice on, on what makes sense. And that's, um, and that's really where our voice comes in. We want to provide the information that these are safe. They've been vetted, they've been, um, I mean, there's so many millions and millions of people that, um, that have used them. We know that they work well and we know they provide really strong uh, uh, protection. And so uh, for, our, for our standpoint, we want to put that information out there for, so that our members and others that um, that deeply care about uh, small business and the difference they make in their communities can um, uh, just take that into consideration as they're making their own personal choice for what, whether or not they want to use it. So currently, um, about 63% of Michigan's eligible population are vaccinated, but it's interesting, it's not uniform across the state. There are some states, Leelanau County is 77%, Oakland County with 1.2 million just crossed over 70%. Um, so you'll see, and then um, Hillsdale County is at less than 40%. So you really do see very uh, big differences. Uh, I, I thought it was interesting there. So Washtenaw County is 69%, uh, Emmett County 68, Grand Traverse County at 68, Kent County at 63.3, uh, Kalamazoo County at 62. So those are kind of on the high end. Uh, on, on the low end, Hillsdale County, Cass County, both under 40%. Uh, in that low to mid 40% range are uh, Osceola County, Macosta, Branch, Montcalm, Lucy, Sanilac, Monroe County, all in the mid 40s to lower 40s. So it really is uneven across our state. And I think what we see, and, and, and the city of Detroit is actually below 40% as well, the city, uh, not Wayne County. But, it, you know, I think I've heard you describe it as both very urban and very rural as part of where our challenge is. Yeah, and uh, actually, let me let me go ahead and share. I had one more uh, slide. I just wanted to wait uh, for this um, conversation that we're having now to um, to show it. Let me see here. So vaccinations, here we go. So um, as you can see, the vaccinations were quite high and then they dropped down quite low and then a little bit of an uptick here. And I think there's a couple of things that are happening. Uh, first is that um, there's a lot of discussion about this variant, maybe it's not over, uh, but also more time has passed. You know, there's a lot of people that were just like, you know, I. 
I don't want to be one of the first ones to take this vaccine. I'd rather wait a little while longer and see how it turns out uh, for others before I jump in. And um, which is, you know, a, a perfectly logical way to approach it. And um, so I think that you have a, a variety of factors that are coming uh, to be, but also I think that uh, people carrying the message have uh, changed up a, a little bit. You know, before it was kind of like, it, it didn't it seem like a two by four? People were like, you know, why won't you do this? You know, kind of uh, beating on people to, um, and, and a lot of times that has the opposite impact. You know, I'm, I live on a dirt road. I grew up out in the country. I, you know, and I, I, I mean, this is, I, I feel like, like I'm one of the, one of the, the people in, in, in a community that, um, that, uh, you know, I, I grew up and live and, and uh, came of age in a, in a place where I understand that type of messaging where you just, you know, get pushed too much or the idea of, uh, you know, a condescending tone, it just pushes you away. And we see some of that turning now too. I think that uh, some of the public health people are, are, are starting to understand that that's not the right approach, but we see widely disparate um, uh, vaccination rates and it follows income levels. If you look at the counties that have income levels and then age. So counties that have um, a disproportionately high number of retired individuals in, in them have higher vaccination rates. And then those that have a higher income, so on average have higher vaccination rate. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a lot of times people like to, to look at, um, to, to look at uh, that other factors like, like race. But in this case, really the most rural and the most urban are the ones that have the lower vaccination rates. And what do they have in common? Um, lower socioeconomic conditions in those, uh, in those communities. So uh, there's a, um, you know, this is, it's, it's not the, the whole, this, a, it's a process, but um, as you see places like Washtenaw County and, um, and Leelanau County, highest in the state, you know, a lot of retirees in Leelanau County um, and, um, and then Oakland County just um, hitting, uh, hitting a milestone of 70% of, of those over age 16. Um, you know, those are big milestones, but it fits with the, uh, with what we, what we see coming out of the polling, which is that those that are more, most hesitant, um, or those that are most accepting are the ones that live in counties that have higher income or, um, are, are older. And naturally, if you're older, you have a higher, a much, much higher risk level. And, and therefore the, you know, the risk reward of, of, a, of a vaccine is a much easier choice and maybe for a younger person in terms of what they perceive their risk to be. I want to return to kind of one of the things we said at the beginning. Um, today, the Veterans Administration announced that all their employees are going to need to be vaccinated. Well, the, the head of the VA is a member of the president's cabinet. Uh, that, is a, that is a national position that uh, I suspect is not operating completely uh, without the, the administration's blessing. Uh, we have heard Dr. Fauci say recently uh, that he is he may be in favor of a national mask mandate. Um, those tend to those those are a little bit ominous in terms of what m messaging coming from Washington. Dr. Fauci over the weekend was um, with Jake Tapper on CNN, and in that interview. He said that uh, that a national mask mandate was something that was being considered or or, um, or talked about, and um, now that that hadn't even when Joe Biden became it didn't happen under Donald Trump when Joe Biden be, became um, president there was there wasn't any kind of push for a national mask mandate so I was a little bit surprised to uh, to hear that uh, to hear that discussed or suggested that it was under consideration. Frankly, I don't think that it's realistic that the federal government would do a broad mask mandate. Uh, they don't have the ability to um, to enforce enforce it across right. the whole country, yeah. and um, and so and the and states have the ability to do these things. Most states have the abilities to do these things on their own. So um, so leaving it to the states, I think. Is is the is the right? Well, I, I know that's the right answer, as opposed to the feds doing it. But what if the feds were to do something? What would they do? I think it's more likely that you'd see the feds do something through OSHA, through workplace safety rules, than um, than a broad mask mandate. So he, uh, Dr. Fauci, did not um, indicate where and how and what type of scope that it was being considered or discussed. 
but um, it, just knowing that system and knowing where the where the powers and the biggest hammers um, lie in terms of their ability to enforce things, I, I think that that if they were to consider something, if they were to consider something or actually do something, it's more likely that it would come through workplace safety rules. We know that they had OSHA workplace safety rules drafted. We know that they had them ready to uh, to roll out, and it was right at a point when um, when the pandemic was. You know, all the trends look like that, that COVID was in retreat here and they pulled those back. And um, of course that was the right decision to pull them back. Uh, but that tells me that, I mean, they were willing to do it at one point in the past. They're probably willing to do it at some point in the future if it look, you know, if, if according to them, the, the numbers justify it. So um, we'll, now that it's been said out loud by somebody who is around that table, Dr. Fauci, uh, this is something that we'll take much, much more seriously in terms of the potential for uh, additional national rules, mandates, limitations, whatever. Well, much like it is not uniform across the counties of the state of Michigan, it is not uniform across the states at any given time. Uh, you know, there was a period of time not that long ago, we led the country for weeks in the number of cases. Uh, now we're at the very bottom. I think we're third lowest in the country. And, and, and Florida is now, you know, at the top of the top of the heap and uh, seasonality and those sort of things, a national uh, response, even if it's through, through OSHA, seems as though it's going to be an overreaction in some areas um, that are really aren't uh, seeing cases increase. Yeah, and that's what, here's the thing that, if there's one thing that we've learned about this virus, looking at, you know, some states had, had um, very onerous rules, other states didn't. And you see these waves come and go. And you know what's the difference? Well, the difference is personal behavior. People make their own decisions and, and people have different risk tolerances. So um, how they go through and their, their lives at a time when, when COVID, the COVID risks are higher and lower, uh, that's really what, uh, w what impacts things at the end of the day. And, um, and so the, what we saw here in Michigan several times was that the government actions actually trailed people's changes in behavior. And, uh, and, and so, so I, that's, that's why we will, be, we will continue to be very, very adamant that, um, that restrictions and onerous rules on businesses uh, with, the, with respect to the pandemic is not the way uh, to go. We have a mountain of evidence that, um, that uh, vaccine advocacy is a better uh, approach a better place to spend our time than um, than is uh, trying to come up with a one size fits all set of rules for for industries and um, and for businesses in all different parts of our state, let alone the rest of the country. Well, it occurs to me that this has been a, a little bit of a downer of a briefing today. Um, just what you know, what what may happen. Let's end on a on a high note or a good note. Uh, the employee retention credit is something we talked about early on. We've talked about it a number of times, but I think it's uh, now it's it's becoming uh, apparent to some businesses who are filing their taxes that uh, it can be a real asset to their business. Uh, would you remind us what this is? And then I think we'll, we'll have some more uh, discussion about it in coming briefings. So we yeah we're gonna we're gonna focus on on this, do some programming um, on it in the in the future because we don't want people to miss out on the on the opportunity that the employee retention credit um, offers. So it's been through some changes. You may have looked at it as it was passed in 2020 and, and thought, well, it didn't, you know, I decided to go with the Paycheck Protection Program, therefore I can't do that credit, but that later changed. So um, if you haven't looked at it recently and certain conditions exist in your business, then it's something that, that it makes sense to take a look at and make sure you don't miss out on. So you can, even if you use the Paycheck Protection Program, if you had wages that were not paid for out of Paycheck Protection Program proceeds, which obviously many, many businesses did, um, then you could potentially qualify for this employee retention credit. It's pretty big. Um, it's on a per employee basis and, um, and it, uh, it's the, the qualifying factors are if, if you were in a business that was restricted by government rules in the pandemic or that suffered a substantial loss and there's a percentage loss requirement for uh, looking at it quarter by quarter. So, um, so this is something that um, 
many of our, our uh, businesses have have used already. I've been in, in touch with with a handful in the last few days just to see how it went. And um, and so uh, and, and and there's been pretty good utilization of it. But I also found some pretty big lack of awareness of the uh, employee employee retention credit. So we're going to focus in on this and make sure that you don't um, inadvertently miss out on a on a potentially very substantial federal tax credit. I've I've seen some uh, some efforts to. Uh, proactively call small businesses and and maybe even charge them a fee uh, to have this done. You don't have to do that. Uh, your your accountant, your CPA can uh, can do this filing for you. You just may need to uh, you know be aware of it. Uh, and as Brian said, we'll we'll do some programming on this. Look forward to a webinar, or we we may have Jamie LaPiccolo come back and and talk about it right here on the briefing. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Um, we'll be back here on Thursday at three o'clock for the next briefing. Uh, we hope you have a great week. Have a great week. We'll see you on Thursday.